So good morning. Thank you for making the trip out here. Uh, we do apologize for not sending out the reminder email, and so a lot more people had signed up. We have well over 350 people, close to 400 signed up. But here you are. So thank you for all of you who made the trip this morning. Yay! <laughs> uh, so this is our class, the sixth class, the last one for the year on composting. Two of our experts are here, and um, is Carrie still coming? Uh, no, she got it. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so, Clarence Gray will be the main instructor, but Sam Gordiola uh, has been our instructor for many years, and probably mm -hmm. Clarence is your protege. That's right. <laughs> so, let me talk uh, a little bit background, and actually, before I get there, let me just do a little bit logistics. We will not have an official break. Uh, feel free to use uh, uh, your own break in the back. The, that's a set of restrooms, and... Um, after the talk, we will be in the demonstration garden for live demonstrations and more Q&As. And uh, uh, volunteers, thank you all for showing up to help make this class possible. We have uh, quite a team here today, and uh, so I'm sure if you have questions that, the two, that we can't get to the two of them, uh, those of us who are here to help will help take care of you as well. So without further ado, let me introduce Clarence. Clarence is a native of Louisiana. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology from Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He also earned a Master of Public Administration degree from Golden Gate University in San Francisco, California. So it crossed both coasts <laughs> for you. He retired in 1995 with the rank of a commander after 24 years of service in the United States Navy, but he couldn't stay retired. He entered the workforce again and retired in 2010 from the State Commission on Environmental Quality as an environmental quality specialist involved in environmental regulation programs for small business, industry, and local municipalities. He also has a variety of volunteer positions with his church, as well as uh, uh, assisting in the uh, school volunteer through Ediv ISD. He's married with two daughters. And Sam here has been a master gardener since 2011, and he was advanced certified in 2012. Uh, he volunteers and speaks to the public on gardens, uh, for garden clubs, and on composting and vermicomposting. Sam is married to wife Karen, and they have two rescued pups. So without further ado, Clarence. Oh, good, good. Go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Angela. Okay, I'm going to try to keep the mic as close as I can. I think they're trying to do some recording uh, of the presentation. And thank you again for coming. Uh, we want to make it uh, as casual as we can, uh, Sam and I. Sam is the advanced trained uh, compost specialist. And so uh, give him all the hard questions. All right. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll, we're going to try to get going so we can, we can um, get through. Um, and I think the program also allows us to transition from this room uh, into the garden area. Okay, that's where the compost bins are. And so we're gonna look at the compost bins and I'll explain a few things there. Experience, you know, actually getting involved is, is really the key to anything really, but composting especially. You gotta get involved, get your hands in the mud and in the, in the leaves and the whatever material you're putting in the compost. And so uh, we'll, we're going to go through this presentation uh, and hope that you will uh, gain some knowledge, more knowledge about composting and, 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 and be able to grow your own uh, beautiful fruit and vegetables uh, in your gardens. And the whole, the, certainly the premise, of course, is that you want to have good soil and good soil produces good gardens okay and so uh we'll, we'll explain a couple of things here in a minute but just just that premise you want to make sure you're good soil good soil produces good garden uh, produce okay whether it's flowers or even or vegetables or whatever trees so just keep that in the back of your mind okay i started off with this little uh, this helped me, and we did this presentation some time ago, I've forgotten Sam, but 
Um, it helped me kind of organize a few things in my mind when we did this presentation. And Rudyard Kipling, you know, the British poet, author, he had this saying, and so I thought it was pretty good to help me, it helped me at least organize about these serving men that he has, that he keeps. And so you can read it there for yourself. I like the last line, he says, and when, but after they have worked for me, I give them all a rest. <laughs> and so, so we want to look at the what, when, why, how of, of composting. I don't know how we advance this thing, uh, Sam. There you go. Huh? Oh, you have it, okay. Uh -huh. There we go, good, good. Okay, again, Sam and I are co-teaching, and so he's going to jump in where, where we need to do some additional explanation of things, and, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, the, the whole premise of, of composting, uh, at least in, in, in Fort Bend and in, with the Master Gardeners, is that we are, we are committed to the Earth's kind environmental landscape management system. Okay. That's the Texas A&M system for maintaining and, and keeping uh, gardens and soils and, and whatever uh, viable. And so that, they even trademark that as you see there. But earth kind is what we, it's kind of the baseline for what we're, we're presenting here. Even the six, the, even the five other presentations that you had earlier are based on earth kind management practices, okay? So earth kind does these four things. That's the premise of what earth kind uh, does. And it's one, of course, you can read, Conservation, water conservation, landscapes for energy conservation, reduction of fertilizing pesticide use, and lastly, reduction of yard waste. And we're gonna we're gonna hit that one here in a second. Reduction of yard waste that's entering our, our landfills. Okay. Now I'm not sure if you've got questions that, that's burning as we go through them. Go ahead and say, hey, I got questions. So go ahead and do that. I don't think Sam and I would mind. Will you? No. Okay, good. All right, so let's go from that last one, reducing waste, okay? And as you see here, every year millions, millions of tons of leaves, grass clippings, tree limbs, organic debris, all of those things end up in the landfill. You see it, you see it uh, uh, when you, when you pass through your neighborhood or through other neighborhoods, you see bunches of trees and grass and all that's on the side because the truck's gonna come and pick it up and take it where? To the landfill. And we see here that the volume represent about 20% of what's in that landfill. Okay. Think about landfills. Landfills are really for garbage, okay? That's what they're for, not for tree limbs and stuff. They're not even for construction waste. It's a different kind of system for even construction waste. But our regular landfills, which are permitted through the TCEQ, have a shelf life, okay? We permit them for maybe 30, 40 years, maybe. And then they have to close down. They can't put more stuff. So we want to reduce that amount. So you see how much money Texans um, uh, uh, 250 million dollars a year to collect and dispose of this yard waste. That's a lot of money. That can go to other things uh, uh, for our, our state. And so we come to the bottom line there that says that composting then is an important practice that can help address this particular issue for sure. Okay, this issue and then and some other things too. Go ahead, Sam. Okay. What is composting? And and that's a that's a very good question. Let me just start first to say what maybe Sam, you can help me. What composting is not? Okay. It's not fertilizing. Okay. It's not fertilizing. Okay. It's not potting soil. Really, you don't want to grow stuff. Okay. Composting and you put your seeds in and grow. No. It's not that. But what, so what is composting? And we'll basically, it talks about the process, but uh, it's an amendment, just to give you the uh, quick, quick, dirty term. Uh, Sam might have a more 
elaborate or, or uh, eloquent term, Sam? Well, I would, I would add that composting is, uh, like Clarence mentioned, a soil amendment. It can help you retain water. It can help regulate the temperature. Um, it provides uh, decomposition of uh, nitrogen and bugs, and when they're eating other items in the soil, they break down near the roots, and the roots then take those uh, nutrients up to the plant. So it's it's definitely an amendment. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anytime you want to grab the mic. Okay, so composting is a process. It's a process. Like Sam says, it's a decomposition process. The most natural decomposition process can be found in our in our forests. If, you, if you're able to hike through forests or whatever, you can see on the forest floor. That's the natural decomposition process. The leaves are there. Beneath those leaves, there are also other leaves that have been being composted. And uh, tree limbs, small limbs, twigs, all of that. You can find all of that on, the, on, the, on a forest floor. That's the natural decomposition process, okay? And um, it's facilitated by the second book bullet there that talks about microorganisms, such as bacteria, fungi, lots of little bugs that help to facilitate this process of decomposition. Now in a forest setting, Sam, uh, that may take years and years and years to happen. I mean, it, it, the water and, and over time the bugs are working. So that can take years and years and years to happen. You don't want to take years and years and years to get your compost going, do you? I don't, I didn't think so. But so that's the natural process. But then what, what results is that last bullet, even in the, even in the forest floor, but that last bullet tells you what, what the result is. It's a, you get this rich brown, crumbly, soil-like material, okay? That results from a natural process of this decomposition, okay? Anything to add there, Sam, about that? Uh, just said if, you know, if it... I would just add that, you know, you look at any pictures of the forest or if you walk around in the woods, that process is happening all the time, but you don't have, like, you know, six foot high piles of leaves and soil and branches breaking down. Um, it's almost like you, you walk, you may get a, a one foot natural pile, but it's constantly happening, whether we do anything with it or not, whether we're turning in, adding water, making sure we're adding air. So, it, it, it's happening. Okay, no questions so far? I have a question. Yes, yeah. well, I just, Let's say you're composting banana peels. Oh, no, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you're composting banana peels, and banana peels are supposedly have um, potassium. I mean, granted, it's probably not a lot like you buy in a bag, but that's kind of fertilizing and composting. That's right. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. So the 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 question was if everybody, if everybody didn't hear was it, let's say a banana peel is in the I guess a natural setting, it it has potassium in it and it's breaking down. Yeah, that's a source of potassium. So all the insects that will eat that, they'll you know they'll either die or they'll lay out their castings and then those castings end up in the soil which is then taken up by the root or another insect will come and eat, eat those, uh, that bug or those castings and it's just a life cycle that goes on. Yep. Thank you, thank you, good question, very good question. I think Sam may address some things when we talk about uh, worm and composting. Okay. So, so we see what composting is not. What composting is, is that process. And so the question then is why? Why do we compost? I did address a little bit about saving the landfill, right? You save the landfill. But also, it also uh, for, uh, reduces fertilizer use. Okay? It's not fertilizer, but it can reduce the use of fertilizer. Overuse of fertilizer is one of the, one of the most, what are the most harmful things that we have in our environment? The overuse. We want our grass green and pretty. 
And so we say, oh, I want it more green and more pretty. So we had more fertilizer to our to the services. But we want to be able to reduce that amount of fertilizer that's used. When we use compost, it conserves, as Sam said earlier, it conserves water. Okay. It conserves water. And then it decreases the amount of waste, as we mentioned, in going into the landfill. Okay, any questions there? Good. Okay, again, the process. It's a process. Uh, I don't know where I did that. Yeah, that second slide, I think I made that up. But anyway, you, it's making a cake, you know, for, for all of us. I won't, I won't just say ladies, or, but I, because I bake, I like to bake. Making a cake, you mix all the ingredients up, and that's what we're talking about in compost, composting today. You mix the ingredients up. Uh, and in fact, we're gonna be talking about how that happens. But you mix all of that up, and then you have to wait. And you have to wait. And depending on the type of composting you do, we'll talk about how or cold. The weight varies. Okay. And so, because the bugs, the, the workers, the workers are the bugs. The workers are the microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi, the mother pigs. Okay. And so, the worms, the pill worms, all of those things are doing the work for you in your compost pile. So that's what you wanna, you wanna keep healthy, okay? So you have to wait until that process does what it's gonna do, and then it'll, it'll you know, there'll be a visible change that you'll see that will uh, tell you that you, you now have produced what you want to add as an amendment to your, to your garden. Okay, so we said why and now the how, okay? Uh, <laughs> Compost happens, you know, it does, it just happens. And uh, I remember the song, Sam, um, y'all might be too young, but it's, uh, I think it's by the Supremes. You can't hurry love. Oh, yeah. You just have to wait, okay? And so you just wait, you wait, and you wait. And so, but there's some things you do in the waiting period, okay? So let's move forward. Now we're getting a little bit more of, 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 of tech stuff, a little bit more detail here uh, as we go, you know, when we're talking about the process, okay? We talked about where, who the workers are, and those are the ones at the top, on the top panel. But then there are a couple of phases, scientists talk about phases of, of the process. They, they talk about the three phases of composting. Okay. okay. And Sam, you may want to add some if you want, but the, the, there's three phases, our mesophilic phase, the thermophilic phase, and the maturation phase. All of those things happening in that waiting process, it, the composting goes through those phases, okay? Microbes um, operate in a medium temperature, break down the larger pieces. Larger pieces get broken down into smaller pieces. The thermophilic phase, the temperature will rise in the compost, okay? And the larger composters, the worms, millipedes, they move out, okay? And the smaller uh, composters then continue that process, okay? First, you break down the, the hard stuff or the, the heavy stuff. And then, secondly, the smaller bugs come in and they continue that process. And then the third phase, of course, is the maturation phase where actually the temperature of the compost goes down. Okay. And uh, they use up the available uh, waste, organic matter. You put more in, guess what comes back? The larger microbes. Okay, they come back in. They start their work again. And then it, so you see the cycle, okay, the cycle happens that way. Sam? Um, when we go outside to the demonstration garden, uh, you have some compost cooking out there that's pretty fresh? Yeah, it's cooking, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, we, we have pulled some compost. So we, we brought a compost thermometer, um, and you can get these for like 19 bucks off of Amazon or something, and uh, they're long enough to where you can plug them in, and they'll take a read, and so, 
what you'll see is uh, items that are cooking in the thermophilic phase, they'll get up to about 165 degrees. Um, not too hot where it would burn your hand, but you can definitely feel the heat. Um, I'm happy to pass this around if you all want to take a look. It's just like a barbecue thermometer. You just don't want to mix them up. <laughs> and, uh, and then as, as uh, worms and the insects are breaking down different materials, it'll start to cool and then we might get in there and turn it, add some water, add some air and it'll heat back up and then it'll do its job and decompose everything and then it starts to cool. So, yeah, it's a cycling process, okay, as you can, as you can imagine. We talked about already, already the, the why we compost, what we compost not, so forth. And now we're talking about the process to get to our finished product. Compost. Okay, let's continue with uh, again some more tech stuff here that that you need to know, and we're talking about ratios. So uh, you're good in math, and this won't be a problem. For you. Uh, but we're talking about ratios, and we're talking about two major ingredients to get compost done. Two major. Uh, ingredients that we want to look at, or oh, elements, I should say. That is carbon and nitrogen. Carbon and nitrogen. We talk about the compost, building the compost bin, uh, making it work, getting a good compost mixture. At the end, you need to know what, what's, uh, how that carbon and nitrogen is making that happen carbon and nitrogen. And we see that most scientists agree that that ratio should be, what, 30 to one. Okay, that ratio should be 30 to one. 30 carbon, one nitrogen. It's 30 to one. Try to keep that in mind. Think about your age, <laughs> 30. 30 to one. Okay, so grass clippings, it says here, is a ratio of what? 20 to 1. We'll, we'll try to explain this a little bit more in a second. Which means that 20 times more carbon, there's 20 times more carbon in grass clippings than there is nitrogen. Okay. Okay, tree leaves, they have a ratio of 50 to 1. 50 times more carbon than there is nitrogen where wood and paper may have a ratio of 100 to even 500 to one, okay? So what's the ratio we're looking for? In our, our compost, huh? 30 to one. 30 to one, right. So you gotta do some math, right? You gotta look at doing some math. Anything added to that, Seth? You know, so there's, on the smartphones, there's some apps where you can you can download different, you know, keep track of what you put in your compost pile, but it's really a feel, right? I mean, you just kind of, once you start doing it, you're like not sure if that's, if it's breaking down. And that's literally when you realize you've hit the, you've done it right, is it'll start to break down and you'll just witness it like without even knowing it. And after a while you get a feel, um, but by weight, you know, it's just think about a quarter to about a third of your compost pile should be your uh, nitrogen source it, it could be like we'll talk about different things that, that's nitrogen but it could be like food scraps or uh, veggies food scraps and then cut up limbs cut up uh, dry leaves dry grass cardboard saw sawdust it's just it, that's that magic rate yep yes so I have a friend mm -hmm. who's not good at math what if you just did it by scent? Yeah, that's, that's what Sarah That's how I've always done it. Yeah, yeah. Put on that friend, that's what she's done. Because <laughs> <laughs> after a while, I'm not going to, okay, there's a piece of paper, there's a yeah, piece of wood. Right, right. Yeah. So what about just going by scent? Yeah, you, you just kind of go by the look and by experience, and you, you just, the one thing that um, a lot of people um, <clears throat> I see make a mistake with the tumblers is they, you get those bins that turn mm -hmm. and they keep adding to it. And so you're mm -hmm. constantly changing that ratio. 
so you, you once you decide to cook, that's kind of it, right? And then you got to move on to a next pile. And so you can do it by scent, you can do it by feel or by look, but don't just keep adding to it, right? Let it cook and break down and do its thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think Sam, Sam hit it on the head, and you'll and you experience that as you go through your 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 building your compost. Like, remember, this is uh, what did it say? These guys here, <laughs> they try to make it precise. They try to make it as precise as they can to give you the give you the the right feel. What they're trying to really trying to do is to tell you. You, you want more carbon than you do nitrogen in your pile. So when you're building your pile, think about it that way. I want more carbon than I want nitrogen. That's what they're trying to get, really get you to, to think about. They made that ratio of you know, scientists in the laboratory or whatever. And they said that that's the best, that's the best ratio that you can have. So we're gonna look in then at those sources. We're talking about carbon and nitrogen. And so what are carbon and nitrogen? And, you know, I don't buy stuff and it doesn't have a big C or big N on it. So we have to we have to know what what is carbon and what is, is nitrogen. Okay, I think the next slide might help us out a little bit. Okay. Brown, <coughs> brown waste I said carbon and nitrogen, so now you think brown and green. Okay. Carbon, it's brown, green, okay, nitrogen. So carbon, brown, carbon, brown, green, nitrogen. Okay. So again, we're still looking at that CN ratio. So here we go with some examples here. Brown material, wood chips. Great for compost. We'll see. We're we gonna put some of those. We've got some of those outside. We'll show you. Sawdust, cardboard, pine needles. Those are all brown materials. And in fact, at least you could say, hey, the color is brown. You know, so some of that stuff. So carbon source, but you look at the ratios of those things again. See how high the carbon ratio is. High carbon high carbon ratios. And so the next one we talk about is the green waste. The green waste equals nitrogen. Okay. Brown, carbon, green, nitrogen. Here we go. Green. So what's green? Fruit, vegetables, coffee grounds, we've got some of those, grass clippings. These are just a little a few examples, okay? That's not a, a, an entire list. Okay? There are other things that that fall into those two categories. But then, you know what I'm saying, just generalizing things that you might immediately be, uh, uh, acquaint yourself with, those are, the, those are the, the, the things that we're talking about. And you see the ratios there, 30, fruit, 25, 40. So, so less of this, more of the carbon. Less of the nitrogen, more of the carbon. It's a trick though, and Sam will probably be better better explain this. If if things are happening in your compost pile and you want, for instance, the temperature is not that good, not that hot, what would you add? So if your temperature pile your temperature in your compost pile is not hot enough, that means that you've got too much carbon and there's you probably have a uh, like a problem sheet or there's out there on the web you can look at them but um, you would add, have to add the green uh, materials to the compost pile and increase that ratio so that um, those, you get it right in that 30 to 1 mix and it starts breaking down again you may need to turn it add some water and air make the conditions right but um, you could add, and it's not just any one of them, you can add a combination of all of them. Um, the one thing I would tell you is uh, with the Green Garden, so I'm a, I'm a member of a lot of different compost groups on social media, and uh, there's a lot of people that always ask, can I compost this, can I compost that, uh, what about this? 
Uh, you want to be careful of putting in like disease plant material in your compost pile because if you're going to reuse it, why would you spread like something that's disease? Go ahead and throw that away. Um, but at the same time, if you have a bunch of strawberries and they've got a little little mold on them and stuff like that, that's okay, right? So just think about where you're going to use it, what what is going on, um, you know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. You got a question? Okay, so you were saying about the mold. Mm -hmm. So let's say you accidentally have wet, wet compost, you know, and it does. Yep. It's so you just turn it. Yep. It'll be okay. Yep. Let's say you have worms in there. It's okay. Yeah. No, that's totally Because I want to toss it. Yeah. No. This, if, if you know, your compost pile is outside, and we'll probably see this when we go out to the demonstration garden. Yeah. Um, that pile is going to get wet. It's going to get rained on. Yeah. Um, if it hasn't rained like it has in the last two months, yeah. when Clarence works that pile, he's probably hitting it with the garden hose, making sure right. that right. in between turns he's adding moisture and air right. into that, no, into I that pile. That. What if it's like in a bin and, mm -hmm. you know, you accidentally, it's too wet and the mold, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of inside the house. You yeah, know, if it's no, too wet then, and it's in a bin when you, um, right. so it. like you have those, stack mold tumblers and you pull it out on the bottom uh -huh. and then you put it on the top and bury whatever food you've put in your pile. Uh -huh. It and should be okay. So, yeah, you're mixing it. Won't it won't like... No, oh, it'll okay. be fine. Just, okay. Just mix it up. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Good question. Very good question. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things here I, that we put in a couple of compost problems. What if it's too wet? What if it's too dry? What do you what do you do? So, uh, if it's if it's too cold, we just mentioned that you might want to relocate the bed in the right spot. If, you can re, if it's if you're able to relocate it, that's that's a good thing. To a, maybe a warmer sheltered area, perhaps wrapping structure like if you've got a, like an outside compost area and uh, a bin, and it's too, it's too cold. The, you can even use bubble wrap around it. Okay. What you want to do is retain moisture inside of the, that compost bin. You can use that. Want to do it? <coughs> what you're trying to do is just in, increase the, the, the heat. Okay. Most of the heat in a compost bin is near the middle. Is that correct? Yep. Near the center of the pile. Okay. So you want to let kind of try to keep, retain the heat inside that inside that bin. You're using a container, okay. The container, I mean, if it's too cold in the container, you may have to do what we said other a minute ago. You may have to add some more nitro, some more green. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. That might increase it. And then oxygenate it. Yes. As a turn. Yeah. Well, I'd rather have it cold than hot. Because <laughs> the hot is where that balance of, and then you get bugs and uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, And the bugs are good, right? They're, well, they're in there. Well, yeah, inside, but the ones that kind of, the little ones that are kind of flying around, I don't like those. Well, and, so. and that's why, as you turn it, yes, yes. right, you're, you're very, because the bugs are there looking for yes. something to eat, right? So you're constantly yes. burying that in it. Yes. And, and so you're not letting them eat everything on top for that long. Right? Mm -hmm. You'll turn it in about three three to five days or two weeks. Well, I don't want too many bugs though, because I I'm more, I'm thinking about my worms more, because right. I want the I want my worms to be happy more than the bugs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, think about the end process, uh, the, the end result. You want to get that compost. Yeah. Oh yeah. You want you want everybody working for you. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. I want everybody. Okay. So too hot. Keep the heat well watered. Okay. It's too hot. Okay. It, it, it just had too much, maybe too much nitrate. Mm -hmm. okay. that, that, that nitrate. If, if you were to, if you were to have in your hand uh, a handful of leaves, say, okay, it was just, it just would be another car And then in the other hand, you had a, like a handful of, of uh, fertilizer, which would be the house. In a very short time, you'll start feeling the heat from that fertilizer. <laughs> Nitrates will, will you know, they, they, they heat up 
And so what I'm saying is that you want to, if it's, if it's too cold, you, want, you might want to add a little bit more nitrate to it, a little bit more green. And if it's too hot, then watering it, maybe even adding a little bit more carbon might help as well. Okay. If it's too wet, you rinse it wet, add more brown material. Make sure the bin is in a well-drained area. That's another issue that sometimes people have with the, when we talk about the open concept of bins, not the commercial ones, but you know, we're talking about ones that you build. If you build it, and for instance, you put it on a concrete slab or something, you know, and it doesn't drain, then yeah, it's gonna retain the water and you can have some problems there. So you wanna drain it, you wanna make sure you get good drainage. And then mix it too dry, try adding green waste and watering your, your mixture, okay? Those are just two, those are just some, some tips uh, based on some common problems that we have in, in our compost, okay? Uh, okay, we're gonna go out, this is, this is a picture of the bins that we're gonna go out to look at. This is, a, this is the garden area, this is right back here. I guess, yeah, that way. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a look and, uh, and we'll show you something. This is, a, this is a, just a picture uh, uh, of the bins that we had. Go ahead, Sam, let's see. Uh, I just threw this in. If you wanted to look at some um, commercial products, uh, again, you can build your own. You can build it from cardboard. You can, lots of different materials, pallets. In fact, I'm building one for my daughter using pallets, okay. Mine only has, I've got a, I've got a, my feet, I've got a wash screen around it. I just open the screen, pour my materials in, mix them up, close the screen back up, it's open, okay? So it can be very simple or very complex. But these are on the, on the commercial market. This is what you can expect to pay for the ones that are commercial in nature, okay? I don't, I don't, uh, I don't get any money from these folks, but I think I have. I, I get this magazine, Gardening, Gardeners Supply Company, okay? And they have a lot of stuff like that, okay? So, Gardening Supply, I, don't, I, I, I use some of their products. Um, in fact, some of the products we have over here on the table, uh, Sisters are, and, and, and Turners are part of, of, part of ones I got from, from this company. But that's just to give you a little bit of a feel for, for uh, pricing, if you're thinking about purchasing one, uh, purchasing a commercial uh, unit, okay? Um, and then I'm gonna turn over warm composting to Sam. He's gonna tell you a little bit more. I just have this one slide that talks about what it is, the system is, but he can give you a little bit more detail on warm composting. So, um, one of the things that you can do if you're composting out in your yard, uh, you can also set up a worm bin or you can do one indoors. There's different types of worms that like to burrow in the ground and there's different little bitty, about six inch worms that will eat your salad scraps and your vegetables and fruits, fruit scraps and they like to be in a worm bin about uh, one to five foot or one to um, five gallon in a bin. They like, um, they like to be moist. They like about 80 degrees or less or 70 to 80 degrees, just like us. And uh, they don't mind being handled. But uh, the one thing I would tell you is if you're gonna look at um, doing worm bins, you wanna, if you're doing it inside, you wanna cut up your materials as small as you can, create as much surface area uh, they don't like worms will eat up a, a whole banana pill but if you cut it up into little slices they'll get through it a lot quicker um, you want to bury the worms give them a medium to operate in and that's moist so one thing we do is uh, you can buy these uh, coconut core bricks right and just soak them in water and they expand and then you put that as a bedding inside your worm bin or you can use shredded newspaper 
and you just take it and cut it into strips, dip it in water, and then wring it out so that it's dry like a sponge, um, or wet like a sponge. You don't want it to where it's real, uh, um, where you squeeze and water comes out of it, right? Um, because then that'll, all that water will sink to the bottom of your bin and you'll create a, uh, an environment that they don't like. They don't want to be swimming in water. They like it moist. And then you just put your food scraps in there and they'll go and within, I mean, it depends on how, what you feed them and how often, but they'll, if I gave my worm bins a bunch of blueberries and a bunch of strawberries, they would probably get through it in a week, week and a half. Uh, they're voracious eaters. Same thing with if you do it outside, right? So uh, I would just say, if you do it outside, you know, do it against like a, a fence or a house, maybe cover it up with some, some wood, plywood or something like that. Give them leaves, an area to operate in, and the, the worms will dig down when it's too hot. They'll come up to feed. If you're putting banana peel and uh, something that, that, that they can eat and you bury it, uh, they'll come up and get it and lay their castings on the top and you can just go through there and harvest. But you don't want to keep it real, real hot or real, real moist. So, oh. yes, ma'am. Well, I was just, um, I used to, in the beginning with my worm bins, uh, put whole, whole kind of foods. Mm -hmm. You know, like peels of the, yeah. the carrots, banana. I do put do banana peel. Okay, but now I grind it up for them. Yep. Because they love to swim in mushy food. Yeah, so I do that, and it's faster too. Yep. Yeah. You're creating more surface area. They love that, right? Yeah. Rather than getting through a hole. Uh, it takes them forever. Right. I mean, it's, they'll eat it, but it'll it'll take a while. I'm sorry, a long time, not forever. Right. Yeah. So. No, that's that's exactly true, right? You want to create a, as easy as environment. The worms, they don't have teeth, right? And so they're right. when they go through uh, the carrots. Yeah. Right, the smaller it is, the mushier it is, they can get through it a lot. Yeah, they love swimming in it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Any, uh, so we've got some resources uh, available that I can hand out to you. So just contact Clarence or I if you want to know where to get uh, worms, either outside, there's one type of worm, and then if you want to grow them in a bin and keep them indoors, there's a different type of worm, the red wiggler or the Icenia petita. And uh, we're happy to give you some different sources where you can go to buy them. Okay. okay so uh, I don't do worms, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's a that's a good way. I mean, it's, you get real rich uh, fertilizer from that through that process. Sam's a real expert on that. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't bring it to bed, <laughs> but. Uh, but anyway, that he explained to you the process if you wanted to get involved in worm composting. It's called verma, right? Verma composting. Verma composting. Okay. There are other types of composting that we aren't covering today. Hoka culture, where you actually bury logs, large pieces in the ground, and they over time will compost. You can even uh, grow stuff on top of your compost if you like. By you know covering it and, and 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 remember it's not soil, but it it's it's amending the soil that that's going to help produce what you're what you're trying to grow. Okay, so there's some, some there are lots there's a lot in composting that you can learn. Uh, we kind of scratched the surface, hoping that you get an understanding of the process, what is what it is not, and what it is. The benefits not only to your garden but also to the environment at, at large keeping things out of the landfill and uh, <clears throat> conserving energy and so forth okay so I guess we'll open up for questions now is, is, is that all right questions now we have some questions and then we want to transition because we've got a few things we're going to show you outside a natural compost bin and how I looked. Okay. Questions? Yes. Yes. Clarence, can you talk about aerobic versus anaerobic conditions in your compost? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, we know, uh, okay, Sam's not going to help me, but when we think about aerobic and anaerobic, aerobic is air. We're thinking about living. Anaerobic, we think about 
the, the lack of air, okay, and they, so, uh, so when we think about the anaerobic process, we, like us, the, the bugs, the microorganisms need aeration, they need, they need water, you know, to, 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 to thrive. And of course they need food, materials. So the anaerobic process uh, is the one that we, that we promote, okay? Uh, and an, and an, and an, I mean, a, the aerobic process, okay? Where we turn the piles, we try to keep it, keep it aerated, and keep it, keep it thriving, because that's what the bugs like. Now, what about anaerobic process? Well, um, I don't know. So, so with the anaerobic process, right, is that there's no air in there, and then the, the materials are still breaking down. So let's say you have a big pile of grass or coffee grounds, they're still breaking down, but if you're not turning the pile, then it becomes anaerobic and it starts to smell. And then, so, you don't have the optimal conditions for that to keep breaking down and it, the pile just goes back to that troubleshooting guide, right? Well, what if it smells or what if it's too wet or, you know, you need to get the conditions right. So you always, you always need air, you need an aerobic process, you need water, moisture, and you need carbon and nitrogen in about that 30 to one ratio. Um, so if you go anaerobic, that's bad, right? So you want to turn it and set things right again. So yeah. the microorganisms are eating others and breaking it down and everything's happy. Yeah. Yes, so if you go to flip your compost pile and say in the middle or to the bottom, it's just mucky like mud yep. and it stinks, yep. then it's probably going anaerobic, right? Yeah, yeah. So there you can't have a, if you have a wet pile on the bottom, there's no air in there, right? So what I would do, and I think we might see a good example of this outside is, you want to put maybe some twigs or something to keep that pile off the ground and where everything kind of builds up on top of that. Um, uh, you could add, you know, I've seen people add bricks or uh, branches or something like that just to keep keep that water build up off the bottom. Now, same thing with um, with the worm bin. You're going to get moisture. You, it just happens, right? You get moisture at the bottom, so when you go to harvest. You always want to catch that um, that moisture and uh, either put it into a compost tea. You can mix it with water and make a compost tea, or you can just soak it up with some dry newspaper. Yes, ma'am. Um, Eggshells. I think you mentioned that. Can you overdo it with adding too many substances? Like eggshells. Yeah. What I I do uh, keep my eggshells. Um, I rinse them. So I, after I make eggs right, I throw them in the sink, rinse them out pretty good, let them air dry, and then I put them in a, I have like a coffee grinder just for that. Yeah. And I just kind of grind them up, crush them into small pieces, put them in a baggie, and just get them as small as I can, and then I spread them in the compost pile. It doesn't break down very fast. No, no, they don't. I mean, but the worms doesn't, the worms don't seem to even, you know, anything to it. That's so the, the worms will use it. So remember I told you worms don't have teeth. They use it for grit to kind right. of pass stuff right. through their uh, intestinal system. But right. yeah, they're, they're, you got to get it real fine as, as, as you can. Yeah. And, they, and that's the next question because I use magnolia leaves and they're not breaking down. Um, and how, what do you use then to break down your, um, so you can, yeah, but my magnolia leaves, um, yeah, right. Chop them up. Yeah. What do you use to chop them up? Lawnmower. Lawnmower, yes, but, but that's even, um, what? Yeah, what do you use to chop them up? Yeah, and what do you use to chop them up? It's still thick. Well, yeah, so it's like, what, and I've seen on Amazon or the, the chippers, like I've chipped one, like I've got a chipper, but they're, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Um, and, and do it, I guess I'm a lazy person. Right, so 
with you. Can you let your leaves dry out first before you put it in? Bro. Oh, yeah, because I find that I can crumble it when it's just air dried. When it's warm, it's, I can crumble it smaller. Okay. Oh. Who has time to sit there? And <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. Well, well, I do the eggs too. The other so thing, if you're <laughs> if you're composting, uh, you might use a screener. So I have a screener. Is there a screener out here? No. Use a screener, and as you you recycle those leaves, right? When you're shoveling it out and putting it in, you run it through a screener, and then maybe they break down small enough to go through. Maybe not. If not, you add them back to the pile. Just oh. keep keep adding, right? Keep adding them until they're small enough, and then if they never break down, then you're talking about you know, the lazy composter, maybe you just don't add them, right? And you, you know, because what you want is you want that compost, right? You don't need big magnolia leaves in the way. You, you can mulch them, you can run over them, um, but if they don't, then just get rid of them. Don't, don't put them in your compost right. pile. Right. Mm -hmm. Shut them up, and that ends up being a lot of my carbon. Carbon mm -hmm. source, right? Yeah. The, uh, let me let me see if I can address her, and then I get to. Were you finished? Okay, you're next. Okay. Um, there there are some there are some leaves, some trees um, that are harder. Leaves are harder to the compost. Oak. Now I don't know. I mean, I probably can. We can find it in a, in a, maybe in a science. Journal, or whatever, but it talks about some leaves are harder because of uh, like the, the shiny surfaces on some of the leaves, like magnolia has a shiny surface, and some other trees have shiny surfaces. Uh, some of those leaves, and then I think the ones that produce uh, like fruit tree limbs, fruit tree leaves are harder. So some leaves are harder to compost. Here's what you can do. You can, you know, just if you let, if you're willing to wait, <laughs> it will compost. Now you got to. Remember, I said you got to wait. Some compost beds, some composting takes a year mm -hmm. to get it done. Okay, you get just got to be real willing to wait. And if you're like you said, I just want to try to make it as easy as possible. Then if you're willing to wait. Then you know it'll 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 decompose yep. over time, okay? But the smaller the better. So even though you don't want to uh, sit there and maybe crumble them up or whatever, if you're able to run the lawn mower over them and put them in a in a pile, and this is what I do: I just put some in the pile and I take the lawn mower, lift the front up, and they're there. If I I don't have a bag, so I have to kind of then rake it. <laughs> Put it together, but if you had a bag, then you could do that. It goes in the bag. You got it in the bag. Now there's smaller pieces, and smaller breaks down quick. So that might be a solution uh, to your to the leaf problem you have with the, with the magnolia tree with the magnolia leaves. Uh, I, don't, I don't have magnolia leaves, but I understand that they are. It may be a more difficult to to compost than some of the other leaves. Okay, the browns. But substituted with cardboard or whatever. Mm -hmm. so we're trying to get more brown mm -hmm. in the compost bin. Now, I think, is that, is that helpful for any? Yeah. Is, is there any, besides the lawnmower, is there any the chipping of the like thing that you talked about, the Amazon boxes? Is that commercial type of chipper about the only other option, the way to go? Is it dropped in your, I got the paper shredders, I've been doing that, but the boxes too. Is 
cutter. <laughs> and get yeah, a box cutter. Just try to make it small. You don't it's, it's not you don't have to make it a you know don't don't make it a big task, you know, and and, and remember that the the, the, uh, the carbon it'll break down, you know, when if you get moisture on it, you know what a wet box looks like, you know, a wet box. It'll it'll break down over over a pretty good short time. So yeah, just break, just tear it, just tear it best you can. Put it in there. It's a good, also car. Uh, it, it help if you put it on the like on the bottom of the bin. It help reduce any kind of weeds or anything from getting into the bin. So that's that's the, the work. The work involved in what You produce compost, you're producing gold. <laughs> so, it, it doesn't have to be a lot of work. Um, I have one compost bin, it's one of those round, like 30 gallon tumbler things I got from Tractor Supply. I put a bunch of leaves in there, sometimes I put kitchen scraps in there, sometimes I'll throw some cardboard, or not cardboard paper in there. And sometimes the leaves take forever to break down. And sometimes it's, it's getting too wet because I've added too much vegetable scraps. And, and uh, so I just, next time I go out there, whenever I think about it, I'll just throw some more brown material in there. And I'll just rotate, I'll just flip it a couple times a week whenever I think about it and go out there. And sometimes it gets anaerobic on it. It will look mucky and wet. So I just put some more brown material and flip it and just leave it. That particular bin takes sometimes a while to break down, but I don't worry about it. Let it go. Now I can create, I create big piles of compost. I have compost piles bigger than this table, but, and I create compost within six weeks. And, but I do it with only four things. Green grass clippings, uh, cardboard, or a uh, little bit of leaves, some brown material, water and air. Sometimes I add a little bit of sugar to it. I'll throw some granulated uh, molasses on top, which you can buy a big bag of. Sometimes they have tractor supplies, usually get these hardware. But put it on top because those sugars help feed the microbes and the, and the macroorganisms that, that feed on it and attracts them and, and then those will break down faster. But those four things, it's really just two two things. I mean, wet green grass clippings and some brown material, and then just keep it kind of moist and turn it. Sometimes if I have some little twigs I'll throw in there to give it some air space. And then I just grab the pitchfork initially about two or three times a week and, and just flip it by hand. Just throw, toss it all to the left. Next week, toss it all to the right. And then after, you know, a week or two, I may only have to go flip it once a week. And then when I get these really big piles, I just go up in my tractor with a bucket and I just scoop it up and then just roll it, flip it, rake it back up tight to a big pile. And I can create, I can turn that big pile into, with just grass clippings and some brown material, cardboard, uh, paper, brown paper, whatever I find, I can turn that big pile into compost in six weeks. Can you bring up the, 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 the tumbler and then the bin? Then you don't have the ground contact. Add a little bit of organic soil, scoop a little dirt from your garden or flower bed or something, throw it in there. Or some finished compost. Yeah, or finished compost. Yeah, Just give it a little sound. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, sorry, go ahead. You're, you're <laughs> Point. What happens at the bottom of the compost pile? Yeah, when it dries, when the top dries, like right when you see it dry, what happens to the bottom? Like does it change? Does it dry with it? So, know. so you think of a pile, right? It looks like that, and so down here is where the finished compost is, and so whenever you you're adding to the top, and so. You want to mix that up and you want to move whatever's finished in at the bottom and bury it bury whatever's not finished on the top and then whatever's on the top gets buried with the finished product on the bottom and so this starts cooking and this starts breaking down and then 
let's say we've already gone through our pile, then we start using it and we start building our pile again. All right, so it's just a, a cycle. Okay, I think lady the go ahead. Neither, neither. But, well, I would, I would consider them carbon, right? Because they're not, they're not going to break down. So yeah. think of like coffee grounds, used coffee grounds, uh, food scraps, salads, salad waste. Mm -hmm. Nothing with dressing on it, right? Just that type of thing. Just any type of food scrap or leaves from your garden or whatever that's not diseased. Stuff that's alive. That's your, your nitrogen. Your carbon is like newspaper, sawdust, stuff that's going to offset that, right, with that ratio that they're going to eat. But, uh, well, I know, I, yeah, <coughs> eggshells, this is what I, I was <coughs> listening to a compost class, and the, the, the uh, presenter, the professor there said, you can add them or not. That's a calcium. That's a calcium. Yeah. That's all it is. And it, and you really don't have to add that. It's nice, and I, and I sometimes when I remember, I'll put crushed eggshells and throw them in there. But the calcium source, carbon nitrogen is what you want. That calcium, yeah, it's a calcium we know is a um, kind of a micronutrient, but it, it's in the, in the grand scheme. It's not, don't think that I'm putting, when I'm putting all my eggshells in there, it's gonna, uh, it's, it's gonna do something magical to the pot, it's not. It's just, it's just calcium. What it will do is that it'll provide, uh, what, what's that stuff, like vermiculite, it, it'll just hold, Aggregate. Yeah, it'll just uh, allow you air, air pockets mm -hmm. to be in your pot. Okay, to allow for air circulation. It can do that part. Okay. But it's a micronutrient. It's not gonna it's not gonna react with like the dry or with the uh, carbon carbon right. or the nitrogen. Right. It's just a it's it, it, so don't don't get hung up on eggshells uh uh in your in your compost pile, okay? But get hung up on on the carbon and the nitrogen sources, okay? Uh, any other questions uh, before we turn to Yes, sir. What happens when you do add the uh, vegetable scraps, the lead, the salad mix that's got, uh, uh, it's got dressing on it? Or you add uh, some cooked vegetables that has oil, or you put meat in your compost pile. You throw, you know, uh, uh, some leftovers that's got some chicken or something. So what happens when you do add that to your no, compost? I wouldn't. I wouldn't add anything with salad dressing or why cook, wouldn't you cook meat because oils uh dressing stuff like that for the pile that we're building in our backyard or in our landscape right subdivisions they're not going to break down you're not going to get them hot enough now at like somewhere at a commercial compost place where they use windrows and like 10 feet tall piles they will get hot enough to break that down and that's how they uh you know you can cook it but I wouldn't do it in your backyard. You're just not going to get that pile hot enough. So and then you get <laughs> and, and attract uh, varmints. Right, you attract varmints. Right. right, you can attract some things. That you, so you try to keep that out. Now, if you put some in there and you say, "Oops, I forgot. Oh man, I put that salad in there. And it's got some dirt. Oh, I don't sweat that. It'll, you know, just try try to not do it. But if it happens, it, you know." Nature is very uh, accommodating. <laughs> okay, and so it'll 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 work its way through. But don't don't do it as a practice. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hot, high nitrogen, very high nitrogen. Yeah. nitrogen. you can use it, but yeah, you got to have that ratio, right? Yeah, it's very yeah, it's manure, very high. Yeah. In fact, you can actually buy. It's more. It's more. I, I, I put it more to the fertilizer side. Okay, of, of the equation. So, I mean, you might want to add if, you, if your pile's not hot enough. I think. I think you can use pellets. I think they sell pellets. The, the other thing is, it's like horse manure, 
dry out, but um, rabbit manure, you don't want to use dog manure, you know, anything that a needs, you know, the parasites that can transfer to humans, you don't, you don't want to use those. Right. And when we go out to the pile, you see in your pile, I don't know if you do it on yours, but what we're, we're, what we're saying, what we recommend is that two, three times a year, add manure. Like I got a bag of black cow manure out there, and I'll add some of that. That just helps fortify, helps, you know, get, keep the bugs happy. You know, and it, so that's, that's, uh, that, that's what you can use as well in your pile. Not all the time, I mean, they don't flood it, but every now and then you can add some, some, some of that. And then you can add a balanced fertilizer, actually. Like 13, 13, 13, something like that. You can add some of that. Again, you want to do, if your pile is not, especially if it's not eating up. Sam? What, what if you have large quantities of horse manure? You want to compost the horse manure. You want to break it down because horses are not ruminants. So their manure tends to have more grass and weed seed in it. <laughs> and it's also not broken down as much as cow manure because cows have two stomachs, horses don't. So you want to compost it, but what about putting it into your regular compost pile? Would you want to do that or not do that? And then how much if you did do it? I have, I have, a, I have a, a, a thought on that. <laughs> and my thought on that is that um, you don't want to introduce um, chemicals or medical stuff that's given to that animal. Like you know, it comes out, and so that that would be my concern with 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 some of that. So if you, if like the farmer or the cattleman or the horseman, you know, has to inject their animal with antibiotics or any kind of other, other kind of chemicals or whatever, it's coming out. Where is that going to go? You put it in your pile. What, what's going to happen? It's going to be in the pile. So that's my thought. You just have to be careful of where you get. Now, if you're on a farm, you know, and the cows are just eating the grass or whatever, and then, you know, that's, that's it. But when you introduce chemicals to the animal, then that might be a problem. Right. Same thing with grass clippings, if on a smaller scale, somebody's throwing a bunch of chemicals in their yard and you're using those grass, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that. And a lot of times people will tell you like, hey, if you don't have enough grass clippings and you see your, your, your neighbor's bagging up is you might ask, do you use anything in your in your yard? Is there wood anything? Now, if you're just spreading it, the compost in your yard, probably not a big deal if you don't mind the chemicals. But if you're going to use it in your vegetable garden, uh, in your house plants or whatever stuff that you'll be around all the time, maybe that you'll be eating, I, I wouldn't. You know, if they're using those chemicals, I wouldn't put it in my compost pile. No, would I? Okay. Okay. Good questions. Great questions. And uh, uh, it's still warm, so we're going to We're not going to be out there too long. It's going to transition because we want to let you look at a pile and and uh, experience that. Uh, there's one more slide on there. I think you need. Uh, do you want them to do this? Uh, yeah. So. You're supposed to have a QR code, but uh, we'll send this out to everybody along with a recorded video. And so if you can uh, answer the survey and that includes question on what future topics you'd like to see us include in the uh, Grow Your Own class. And uh, so um, other than that, we can go ahead and go out to the garden. Thank you. My worms are supposed to do their thing too, but it just takes time. Stick it in there and turn it. I just see it's like a fork like she's holding. Oh, here. Here you go. I have the same thing. That works really well. Yeah. So, and then if you have the kind of bin that has the little slats, so let's say I put my kitchen scraps on top, I'm going to lift the slat, I'll get in there. You want to make sure you leave enough room so you can go. It's got slats on all four sides, so don't put it up against the house because you're not turning the bin out of the one side, but then you'll just bury it, and then um, that part in the middle will cook. You're using the stuff finished on the on the end, and then once this bin is 
I've got it to where I want it, I want to cook. Then that's where you start in your second pile, you start building your process and adding your carbon and your nitrogen. So now in this case, they have four uh, where they're, you got one that's cooking and um, you got one that hopefully that you're, once that's full, then you're, you start a new one and then you have, and then once the second one is full, then you start on the third or the fourth, right? And so you always got one that you're using, one that's cooking, and one that you're building. Right, so it's the cycle. This scrap way goes into this bin. So we, we, we compost that waste and, and move it forward. So again, Here's the a, process. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, Clarence has some examples of uh, shredded uh, carbon that he's got ready to go to the pile if he needs it. He's got some grass clippings. Grass clippings. Um, you can put that five gallon bucket. Coffee. Yep. All that goes in there. We talked about cardboard with the lady. <laughs> Use your manure. Yep, just, you know, it's going to be as big as that. Okay. 
have to be I'm trying to like over, a, I'm trying to over stress. <laughs> I'm saying yeah. And of course, <laughs> bra so you need to know that's carbon. That's the brown, okay? That's the carbon. No, this isn't brown. That's coffee grounds, right? So guess what it's called? What, what, what category would it go in? Green, correct. Green. So brown and green, of course. Of course, the grass was greener before we, before today. But uh, but this is also a nitrogen source. Green. And uh, and this is the what I add in about two, three times a year. Put it in there. It just helps helps uh, amend. See, even, even these bins are very, of course, our folks built these bins, and they, they, they did a pretty good job, but they don't have to be as elaborate as what we see here. Um, this is one of the tools that, that I got from that gardener supply that works. It goes into the, into the pile, shove it down, turn, and you can lift it up. That turns the pile at a deeper level, okay? where you don't have to try to go all the way down. Cause, but this thing here allows that to happen. Go in there, and you can turn it, lift it out, and now you got a good aerated. Um, I normally have these out. You can do it. And you can see actually what's on the bottom. You see, if you look at those, if you look at it, the, the layers, the screens, you can actually see the layers. So, I can see it's crazy. Yeah. You feel that? Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, it's hot. Yeah. yeah. So that's down in the center of the pile, and it's and 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 it's not it's not too moist down in there. Okay. And so no, that's good. That's good. not to eat, but to throw. Yeah. And you see how it's starting to break down, how grainy it's getting. Okay, it takes a while, but it, it gets grainy. It gets grainy. You got to just be able to wait. Time to wait. Now the grass clipping they say shouldn't be more than about one or two inches when you layer it because it pads. I mean, it packs in. See how it's packed wants to stay together so you don't want too thick of a layer because you then you're actually putting up a barrier so that's that's what we use to get this now the, the good compost is at the bottom okay always at the bottom right? so I gotta dig and dig separate and then I'll screen and then it moves and then the gardeners who use it in the beds I don't know if you've ever taken a tour here. They use it in, the, in these beds here, and then they use it in our other garden. We've got about five or six other gardens on this side, okay, that, 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 that we had uh, demonstration gardens. HOA garden, where your HOA uh, 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 gives you a good idea of what HOAs will let you use in their, in your yards. Um, it's a butterfly garden. It's a Texas superstar garden. You know what superstars are? Those are the ones that are easy to, easier to maintain, um, and uh, and they're easier to grow. And they're there. And then there's a shade garden. Uh, it used to be the Japanese garden, I believe, but it's called the shade garden now, and it's really tree lined. And you can go and sit, see some of the exotic, some of the uh, exotic plants that they grow in the shade garden. So there are about five or six gardens over there that you can enjoy. Sometimes when you have time, you can you can 
come through and just look at these guys. In the fall, I guess I should promote, if, you, if you're looking for good vegetables, nice vegetables, on October 7th, we're doing the vegetable sale. I know you're gonna be there to help out, aren't you? Yeah. We're gonna do a vegetable sale in that same building where you, I think it's in that building, isn't it? Isn't it Butter Shields? Yeah, Butter Shields. Yeah, in that building you just left. Uh, so, come early. <laughs> because a lot of people come out to that sale okay so you and you get excellent vegetables large variety i can hardly wait to see it they do well in this and in yeah, this county in this yeah in this in this county okay in this, in this environment so uh so composting is fun make it fun you know make it a, a chore um once a week is about all you need huh? just turn them at about once a week make sure it's got moisture Add the food, and the bugs will love you for it. I mean, right now they're applauding, you know. <laughs> so um, that's it. Any, any, uh, and I guess we didn't mention this is a big tumbler we have. Materials into it, mm -hmm. okay. And of course, like you just use the crank and tumble it. Uh, and that's you can even get the kids involved. Oh, they'll love to tumble this. Mm -hmm. And so let them tumble. Go, go out and tumble the, the, the compost bin. Let them tumble the bin. Yep. They do the work, and the bugs do the work, and you sit back and enjoy the beautiful plants and uh, vegetables that you create. Okay, Sam. Anything? Any parting words? It's, warm I don't want to keep you out here no I, I would just say that uh, we were talking about you know you want it to be lazy you know don't set up your compost bin so far away from your kitchen or on the opposite side of your water hose you know try to put some thought into where you're gonna stick it so that it's easy um, because if you are when you turn the pile you got to add a squirt of water but if it's far away from your your water hose you know then you got to carry water over there and then it becomes a chore to <coughs> Just think about you know everything that you heard about today, and just try to find an optimal place for you. Okay. Any final questions, anybody? Uh, where's our host? You got something? Some party, parting words of wisdom. No, no.